Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the IT Web webinar looking at how bots are enhancing customer experience um, across various platforms. This conversation is made possible by our friends from IOCO. My name is Ms. Lassie Arenta, and I will be monitoring uh, the next session and also taking uh, you through some of the questions that may be coming through. We've got a fantastic um, set of speakers lined up for the next hour or so. So if you have any questions, please um, put them through the chat facility and we will get through as many of them as possible. So artificial intelligence and chat box are disrupting the traditional role of knowledge sharing in contact centers or call centers and reducing the burden on humans. It's a well-known fact that customers hate to wait and research shows that some customers have stopped doing business with some of their favorite brands after just one episode of either waiting for too long for a customer service agent to solve their issue. So in light of these facts, it's a little wonder that average handle time has become such a leading indicator of the success of many contact centers. So we're gonna be talking about how do we bring in bots into this entire ecosystem in order to enhance the customer experience. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can pop them in the Q&A session. And then after our presenters are done with their presentations, we will get through the Q&A. Um, to start us off, I'm going to introduce our um, people who are going to be doing the presentation for us. We've got Johan Dupree, who is a business development uh, in automation and IOCO, and Pumi Ndobo, who's a cluster executive for Gauteng at IOCO. To start us off, uh, as you get those questions uh, up and running, uh, I'd like to welcome to the virtual platform, uh, Johan Dupria. Uh, Johan, the stage is yours. Thank you, Nastasia. Hi, good morning, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Johan Dupria, and I have the privilege of helping customers on a daily basis to, to optimize their businesses using automation technologies. So today I'm going to, to chat to you a little bit about how we change our customers' world and, and how you can change your world in the contact center space uh, by using certain technologies uh, to really aut automate experiences. So to start, to start off, um, what I want to do is just set a little context around some of the the business challenges and, and why these things are important. Um, so if we look at kind of the top line there, there are some business imperatives that are that really resonate irrespective of the industry or you know where you find yourself in business. And these things tend to be pretty evergreen. So any organization you know concerns themselves around retaining customers, acquiring new customers and obviously optimizing cost. And I think especially considering the impact that, you know, the, the global pandemics had over the last year and a half, these have just become more and more important in our daily lives. Now, interestingly enough, that translates to some, some pretty interesting challenges when we look at contact centers. Um, so if we look at the two type of challenges that presents to us, from a customer perspective, it, it really manifests itself in interesting ways. So for instance, repeat activities are, are things that suddenly frustrate customers more and more. You know, we're not at a time where, uh, you know, authenticating a customer three times because, because you hop them between different agents is acceptable. Um, some of the other challenges or another example is uh, customer expectations. So not even from your competition only, but if I, for instance, am a telco, the experience that the banks give my customers uh, creates these expectations from an omni-channel point of view that I now suddenly need to realize. So, you know, if I take myself, I might log into my banking app and it's really simple to, to open up a new loan account or a savings account. It happens in a matter of seconds. Yet when I open up my mobile app from my telco provider, I can't get a fiber line at home uh, in such a simple fashion. And all of a sudden I have this expectation that I need to be able to do that. And then I think the last one that I just want to use it as, as an example is this expectation of always on. So if I like 
in bed at night and I'm busy browsing private property and I see a nice new house. Um, why can't I apply for a home loan and get it processed 11 o'clock at night? You know, why do I have to wait until the next morning for the home loans team to arrive at, at the offices or arrive at work before I can do this? So I guess from a customer focus perspective, it, it, there are a, a lot of interesting challenges that uh, that gets presented to us um, by customers just expecting more. From an operational perspective, there's also a few complex challenges that, that come to light. So if you are in the contact center operational space, I'm pretty sure that you've been told that you need to improve customer service and at the same time reduce cost. And these things tend to work against each other. So, so how do we make this happen? Um, you know, how do we drive out both these uh, imperatives and, and be successful? And then quite a common one as well is just the technology nature or the nature of technology that we deal with today. Um, you know, as it stands, I don't know of any, uh, any contact center where you have a single unified platform that just does everything. There's a multitude of backend systems that our agents need to interact with, which creates a, a, a complex experience and a complex journey for these agents to, to service our customers. So these are some of the real pressures that, that, that uh, manifest themselves if we look at the business imperatives that organizations go through today. And that's really why we try to look at using technologies in a novel way to, to solve these problems. So we've been challenged by a few customers in that space to say, you know, what should the contact center of the future look like? Um, and interestingly enough, if you look at some research, they uh, even up until around 2020, 2019, you, you read quite a bit about what the contact center of the future needs to look like. And what we've seen is the last year just accelerated that significantly. So it used to be a space where you could say the contact center of the future needs to be digital and you need to have these automated agents, et cetera. But we are actually seeing this daily um, in our customer base where we, where we do these things for, for customers. And to remain relevant, you need to make sure that, that these things are either on your roadmap or, or already in progress um, to stay ahead of your competition. So some of these topics and trends, um, if I can use a few examples, so task automation and robotics, how do we use robotics or let's say uh, robot assistance to make our agents more efficient? And that could be uh, simple things like fetching data from a CRM system instead of having our agent log into that CRM system. From a consistent digital service point of view, it really speaks to that omni-channel experience and providing the same capabilities across the different channels. So whether I interact with, um, you know, interact with my service provider via a WhatsApp chat or a mobile app or a web portal or the call center itself, I need to get the same functionality features and service across the board. Then if I move on to a single, single pane of glass, um, quite a big problem and more complex in some industries than in, in others. Um, providing that single view of a customer so that when an agent picks up uh, a call, they can actually see everything uh, of the customer across both products um, and different systems in the back. Uh, it just speeds up the ability to, to service that customer significantly. Digital agents, uh, that's really when we look at the traditional almost chatbot, but, but moving into an intelligent space. So how do we make use of intelligent assistance to service our customers? And typically that, that is surfaced through either a, a WhatsApp or some digital channel in a chat form with even transparent handover to human agents when the digital agent cannot service you anymore. Analytics and intelligence, I think that's been a, a very hot topic and it's a, <laughs> both a blessing and a pain for a lot of people, but we have such a magnitude of data 
in call centers and in the business operations. And, you know, we need to, to use this more effectively so that we can start predicting customer behavior. A good example, again, is if I've logged into my insurance portal or my insurance app and I had a look at my claim statement, if I then call my insurer, there's a 90% chance I'm calling regarding a claim. So why not use that data at, that's, that's available to route me to an agent that can assist me with the claims query? Because that'll very likely be why I'm calling. And then I don't have to be hopped between different call centers or, or agents. And then uh, the last one I want to touch on is the, the concept of one call to solve it all. Um, and I'm pretty sure most of you have experienced the, the challenge where you, you call into, a, let's say, a service provider where you have multiple products and you want to change something simple like a debit order date. And 80% of the time, you end up being bounced between different agents because a single agent may not be able to update your debit order date for your fiber contract as well as your mobile contract or for your life insurance and your short-term insurance. Um, and that expectation and the ability to have one agent service me across different needs, even potentially right sell or upsell me, is, is something that um, I think makes a significant impact in the customer service and customer journey as well. So these are really some of the key trends that we see um, moving towards the what and I like that little statement at the top, you know, the contact, the contact center is dead, long live the experience hub. So moving your contact center to a space where you really craft experiences that satisfy your customers and assist them rather than just catching frustrated customers and helping them in a very ad hoc fashion. All right, so as I'm going through the slide, uh, I quickly want to, to spin up a poll uh, just to see some of the challenges that, that you are experiencing on a daily basis. So some of the common challenges that we find in contact centers today, and especially looking at the South African market, um, and this is across different industries. Um, can really be once again divided into two. So looking at the customer focus area or the customer perspective, uh, there tends to be limitations in self-service, um, either in self-service or consistently across self-service channels. So uh, I like using the example of, um, you know, asset financing and banking. It's one of those things that we haven't really gotten to the point where you can do that in a self-service fashion around the clock. Um, you know, you need to still get in touch with an, a physical person in some form or factor to push those kind of things through. And customers have this expectation that you need to be able to do everything digitally or from a self-service perspective. Limitations around 24 seven. So similarly, I might be able to do 80% of what I want to do around the clock. Um, but in a lot of cases, whether I call or go through self-service, some things are only available during business hours. Um, and that's natural because it's the way that our businesses work. But these are challenges uh, if you look at customer expectations. Long waiting times, uh, unfortunately, I don't think any call center is staffed to the capacity where you just have agents sitting around and waiting for the next call to pick up uh, at the drop of a hat. Uh, it's counterintuitive, you know, it, it just, there's no budget to really cater for that. So that is a real challenge. Uh, there's always a bit of a wait, and especially in high traffic or high volume times, that does translate into frustratingly long waiting times. Call dropping and call bouncing. So I think, if I think about one of the most frustrating experiences, uh, it's probably waiting on a call, listening to elevator music for five minutes. And just when you get to the point where you think your call is going to be picked up, the call drops. Or dialing in, reaching an agent after a long wait and explaining your problem. And the agent says, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Let me put you through to our claims department. And then you go back into the waiting queue. Um, so that's 
uh, that's quite a prevalent issue as well. And then again, the inconsistency across channels. Um, you know, being able to do some things on a mobile app and then different things on a web portal, then again, different things when I contact the call center telephonically, um, creates not only frustration, but also confusion. Uh, which wastes the customer's time. If I look at the operational focus, so some of the real challenges that we that we see, and that's more an inward focus, um, complex and siloed technology landscapes exist pretty much everywhere. And by nature, your business um, is structured to do certain things. So your sales function has tools that allow them to sell your operational business operational functions have tools that allow them to run the business um, it doesn't mean that we don't need to tap into those tools in the customer service space but it means that sometimes it's inefficient to tap into those uh, on a per case basis and and that creates some real challenges it may it makes the agent journey quite complex high cost so not only looking at staff cost but also things like per seat licensing of your telephony platforms. Uh, call centers are an extremely expensive uh, element in, in a business, and it is a constant, uh, a constant challenge. Slow service. So as I mentioned in the first slide, you know, you constantly, or we constantly see these differing or conflicting priorities around reducing cost and then up, upping service as well. So how do you reduce cost and lower, let's say, headcount and, and licensing, but still improve service? It's, it's, it's difficult. So, you know, keeping cost effective a lot of the time translates into slower service because of various reasons. Always being reactive. So if I think about the traditional nature, if I call a call center, the call center agent doesn't really know why I'm calling. So it's a very reactive thing. Um, if we could move to more proactive activities, it would it would help our customers quite a lot. But currently, you know, some of the challenges that, that we do see is customers struggle to get to that proactive, um, proactive point. And then poor use of analytics. So there's a lot of data available to us, but most of the time, it's really difficult to accurately pinpoint where our bottlenecks sit. And as apart from that, you know, there's a lot of business data that doesn't get used efficiently enough to, to help us service our customers better. So, so those are some of the real challenges that we see in contact centers today. So before I move on to the next slide, I think it's uh, let, let's quickly have a look at some of the poll results. And if I look at the statistics, slow service and being reactive, those two are head on head, are head at head. So at 32%, which I think is, is not uncommon. It, it speaks to what I see in the industry uh, a lot as well. Uh, quite interesting that high cost is so low, um, only at 3%. Uh, I tend to, in, in my personal experience, uh, that comes up as a as a topic quite often. Um, the complex technology landscape, yes, I also expected that to, to to be right up there with the rest, and then poor analytics coming in second to last. All right, so so thank you for your contributions. It's it's actually quite interesting to see that. Uh, but yes, I think slow service being very prevalent, um, that is a customer service challenge across the board. So I think the what we'll talk about a bit later, hopefully that will give you some, some insight into what you can do to, um, to, to solve these type of, of, of challenges. Okay, so having had a look at some of the pressures we face and, and really what the contact center of the future can look like, um, I think the next question is really, so, so how can we change this? You know, what are the things we can look at to, to really help us change the customer experience um, and service our customers better 
and, and look at some of these other drivers as well. So, you know, how do we optimize our technology landscape? How do we drive down cost and so forth? So if I look at the, the customer segment, um, conversational interfaces, so bringing in bots to supplement our channels, um, that, that adds, especially for the younger or more tech savvy um, audiences, adds an additional means to contact us so we can drive down the actual call volume and deflect those calls to digital channels. Bot assisted agents, so when we get to our case study, I think um, that uh, that shows the massive impact that bot assistance uh, can have for agents' efficiencies. Um, but really, that that looks at how do we get digital workers to to help our agents be more effective and more efficient and service our customers a lot quicker. Mobile self-service applications. I don't think anyone is unfamiliar with this. So building out rich digital channels uh, where our customers can serve themselves. Providing a single integrated portal for agents. Now, in most cases, we combine that with our uh, bot-assisted agents because the two really go hand in hand. But it's around providing that single pane of glass so that our agents know exactly what a customer is, uh, what a customer needs, and what they've done, and what products they have uh, at a glance. And then digital proactive customer interactions. So that can stretch from simple things like in a telco, picking up that there's line outages in a certain area and informing everyone in that area that we are already on this. You don't need to call us and ask what's wrong. Um, through to retention in vehicle and asset finance, telling a customer that, look, we see that you're almost at the point where you usually buy a car, um, can we call you and see if there's a new model that you would like to buy? So really driving out that contact proactively to customers and, and using the data at our disposal to drive those interactions. From an operational point of view, so integration between uh, portals and the various backend systems, either through traditional integration or through non-intrusive front-end type integration using tools like RPA. Workflow and task automation, so I think that's been around for ages, but uh, not necessarily used very effectively um, everywhere. And then using things like trend analytics and issue identification from our data. Uh, those can really help us quite a lot. So, so why would we try and do these things? So really the value that we're trying to, to push out is to expand and extend our customer self-service capabilities, which helps us push up um, our customer experience or push down the customer effort scores, allowing 24 seven support. So how do we service our customers uh, around the clock so that you know, we, we don't have to have them wait until the morning to call in and, and get service. Speeding up call resolution, so really driving down that average handling time um, so that we can service more customers with a lower headcount or frustrate our customers less. Uh, reduction and elimination of call bouncing. So I'm quite passionate about that. Um, you know, reducing the need to hand a, uh, a customer off from one agent to the next purely because they need to log into different systems. Um, that provides massive opportunities for improvement. And then looking at proactive issue communication and also resolution. How do we solve problems before our customers actually call us and reduce those call volumes um, using that approach? From an operational point of view, why we do these things? We want to reduce operational cost. Uh, we want to take away manual tasks. So the more manual tasks we take away from agents, uh, the more effective and efficient they are and the quicker they service our customers. And then managed issue resolution. So looking at a structured process to, to solve issues rather than um, you know, just tackling things ad hoc. So if we look at the previous slide, you know, it's, it all sounds great, but but how do we do that? And I think 
that really brings us to 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 the topic of you know how do we use things like bots to to improve customer service so i think firstly what I, if, if I look at the cognitive agents on, on the left there, so using chatbots efficiently across channels um, has really shown us uh, significant improvements. So not only using a, a traditional, um, I would almost say dumb uh, chatbot, but using some of the cognitive services and, and AI services available these days, we can identify intent, we can do natural language processing, and we can strike up a um, experience where the customer feels like they're interacting with a personality. And that bot is smart enough to understand the customer's problem and then to tap into some of these RPA or worker bots at the bottom um, to actually execute activities. So we don't need agents to necessarily be part of that journey. Um, a good example would be uh, if I want to do a, well, let's use a simple, a simple example. If I want to, on a prepaid, uh, on a prepaid phone or prepaid mobile package, I want to convert some of my airtime to to mobile data, and you know I, I'm struggling to get into my app. Why can't I just open up WhatsApp, ask the, um, let's say my telco, my telco bot, you know, could you please buy me a two gig bundle using the airtime that I have? And that's something simple that a bot should be able to help you with. It might ask me, great, Juan, do you want a daily bundle? Do you want a 30 day bundle? Or do you just want, uh, um, you know, a once off bundle that will expire after you've used it? It can take my response and it can process everything without having to interact with an agent and while my mobile app might not be functioning. The second, workflow. So even if we interact with these intelligent agents or digital agents, there's typically some process flow that happens in the back, especially if you look at more complex scenarios. So if I start moving into the issue identification and the resolution space, um, there may be multiple activities that need to happen. So I might be inquiring around, um, you know, why I was declined for a certain finance application. And once again, th this isn't something that a person needs to tell me. All of this data is available in systems. Um, a chatbot could actually catch my request it, go, it could go and look in system one. When it finds certain results in system one, it could move on to the next and the next and the next. So really structuring that process flow and gathering all that data and feeding it back to me in a structured fashion is where we see workflow playing uh, quite a big role. Then moving on to robotics. So where workflow pushes data from one task to a process, from one task to the next, robotics really helps us execute those tasks without human interaction or intervention. So we traditionally, I would have had to route my request to an agent. The agent would physically have to log into a portal, look at my specific profile and get that feedback and you know present it telephonically to me. Um, we can use a robot to go and get that, that data out um, in the blink of an eye, feed it back and present it to me either through a virtual agent or a chatbot into a mobile app or even to an agent that might be speaking to me. So quite a lot that, um, you know, the robotics space bring to us as well. If I move to the bottom row, some of the more traditional, um, uh, let's say tools and techniques still in use, there's still a lot of value in integrating systems. So as, uh, as we've seen in the poll, a disparate technology ecosystem is one of the key challenges that, that we face today. How do we create unity? So integrating these systems where possible and where feasible um, still adds a lot of value so that we don't have to hop between different systems and have you know, these disparate sets of data that we need to bring together manually. Advanced analytics, so how do we use the data at our disposal better. How can I use things, and I think I used the example before, 
how can I use things like the customer's last five actions um, to really guide the agent to, to know why I'm calling in? You know, if, if I looked at my claim statement and I looked at my, um, let's say, my, my monthly statements, there's a high likelihood I'm either calling because of a claim or a billing inquiry. Um, and why not push me or present that up to an agent immediately when they answer the phone so that they know that, you know, this is very likely why I'm going to call. And then I think last but not least, computer vision, multiple ways to use this wonderful technology. That it ranges from document understanding, so really reading documents and interpreting documents in simple, in simple cases. Um, through to identifying objects within imagery and video. Uh, a nice example is through through processing of minor vehicle claims in insurance. You know, we, we don't necessarily need to 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 have an in, a, a claims agent assisting a customer or assisting a broker in processing a minor claim. You know, theoretically we could do through processing without having any human touch. So quite a lot that computer vision also brings to, to the party um, around automating experiences in the, uh, in, in, in the call center space. Some things to, to think about. Um, so now having spoken a bit about the technology, a few things to consider when we look at these technologies. Um, and I think this is very important uh, to, to drive out success. Customer journey mapping and user experience design, in my experience, is extremely important. You can buy the best and shiniest tools, um, but if you do not implement them with a customer-centric mindset, you're going to spend money and you're not going to get value from it. So really understanding what it is that my customer wants um, and just defining those, those journeys effectively that's what's going to help me um, improve customer experience and drive down the amount of calls that I get uh, in the call center. Because a poorly designed customer experience would just frustrate your customer more. And what will end up happening is me as a customer, I'll try to go through the digital channel, I'll get frustrated and I'll call your call center in any case, um, just more frustrated than I was. Plug and play chatbots, so those are pretty great. There, um, there are quite a few plug and play chatbots that gives you rapid time to value. Um, it means that you don't necessarily have to, to get developers in to code something from scratch. Uh, there's a lot that you can do from an accelerated perspective um, to really show value quickly. And usually these are quite extensible. So, um, you know, taking technologies like well, the Microsoft or Azure, uh, um, Amazon uh, cloud technologies, and really building building value quickly uh, really helps us um, manage costs as well. Robotic task and process automation, as I mentioned before, it really, really helps to, to, to alleviate some of the mundane, repetitive, and high volume tasks that agents need to do. Um, a lot of value uh, that, that we see is being derived from implementing these technologies effectively and smartly. System integration, uh, it could be a beast, you know, and some depends on, 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 on the ecosystem. So be careful of it, but also be cognizant that, that it, it does still have a lot of value. You don't want to go down a three-year integration journey if you're trying to solve an immediate problem, um, but do think about the, the fact that system integration really helps you tie solutions together um, that in the end, uh, and, and in the end, that, that helps your, your call center as well to get the right data to people at the right time. Workflow technologies and subsequent development around that. Um, digitizing processes, I think, is extremely valuable in the customer, center or customer service space. Uh, the less digitized, the more time consuming. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I would say go go for digitization. It really is the right way to go. And then the last two really in unison. So using the data at our disposal smarter. Uh, I, I haven't encountered a call center where there's not a massive amount of, of data available. Um, 
and really using that to build out some predictive and prescriptive models can help us a lot but also just working smartly to identify bottlenecks and look at how do we how do we supplement um, certain streams uh, at peak periods etc could really could really help a lot and once again that informs these analytics usually informs how we can effectively implement technologies uh, all the technologies listed above uh, to, to solve our problems. All right, so I think lastly, now that we've spoken a bit about the problem, some of the technologies that we can use to, to solve it, I just want to go to the last thing, and, and that really is the approach. And um, for me, this is very important. I've seen in, in, in my career, I've seen uh, a lot of engagements fail because of uh, just using the wrong approach. I firmly believe in this, and you know it might seem like a, a pretty straightforward approach, um, but just going back to base, to basics when it comes to, to to taking an approach is is really is is really effective. So when we started out, we we listed a few core drivers. So you know what are these business imperatives that's driving my organization? And these tend to differ slightly from, from industry to industry at the moment. So if your core driver is to cut cost, I mean, that, that's a very important thing to keep in mind. You don't want to go and invest in uh, processes that will do wonders for, um, you know, the experience of your agents as employees, but they're not going to save you cost if cost cutting is one of your core drivers. So it's very important to list and understand and prioritize your core drivers um, up front. Then what we need to do is look at the available scenarios. So based on these core drivers, there will be a lot of scenarios that may or may not uh, be relevant. So what we do to identify these scenarios is we look at data. Um, I, I'm still a firm believer in traditional analysis. So, you know, uh, interacting with your call center operational staff, uh, interacting with the technology people, um, you know, really understanding the environment through interviews and analysis, etc. But then also looking at technologies like process mining. Uh, so there are really brilliant process mining tools around uh, that you that you implement on on your systems. And they take a look at the true flow of data and they'll tell you, look, 80% of these specific call types um, don't actually follow the process that you think they follow. You have process diagrams that says X, but these calls actually follow a completely different process. So you might want to look at these because uh, they in turn will shorten or cut out a lot of time spent by your agents. So different techniques and tools that you can use to to identify scenarios. Um, and then I think after we've identified these scenarios, we need to score them against our core drivers. So typically the way we would see it, there would be two or three core drivers. We would come up with about 15 to 20 candidate processes or candidate scenarios or use cases. Um, out of those, we actually need to measure and prioritize them to see which of these would meet or would best meet um, our mandate? Uh, so which would save the most, the most cost, which would improve customer serious, uh, customer experience uh, by the biggest margin, et cetera. Once we've done that, we select a subset and we go and say, look, maybe we'll start with three. So we take those three, then only do we start looking at what is the right solution. And I think when it comes to solutions, something that I firmly believe in is be technology agnostic. That is always our approach. We don't take a tech-led approach. Firstly, we look at what investments have already been made. So what is in the environment? What are these tools that are there already? What can we reuse? Um, and what are the subsequent gaps? So we look at those technologies. Um, and then we look at the possible solutions. Uh, how can we potentially solve these problems? It may be a technology solution. It may be educating your customer base. Um, it could be additional training to your call center staff. 
or it could be a combination of all three of these. Once we've then uh, chosen the right solutions uh, and implemented or developed or deployed these solutions, um, we actually need to sit and measure the real impact because up front we said, well, this is the estimated impact. So we create business cases for them. At the end, we go back and we measure it and we look at, did we really achieve these measurements that we wanted to achieve? The reason that we specifically follow this process is we want to ensure that we continuously derive value from what we do. Uh, we don't want to end up in situations where, uh, you know, you invest in other technology process or people. Um, and at the end, we don't meet these, um, th these prerogatives that we need to meet. Some of the, uh, the, the little bullet points at the bottom, so that's uh, a pretty good uh, scenario or uh, let's say example. So this would be typically for a telco. If we look at the core drivers, it would be uh, cost saving, then customer service, then revenue generation. Some of the scenarios that came out of analysis was looking at uh, digital prepaid uh, recharge through, to th through and through, so without agent interaction. Um, service interruptions, and then billing queries. How do we take these and minimize uh, agent interaction? Uh, the reason we look at minimizing agent interaction is we want to drive down cost as a primary driver, for instance. So if those are the use cases, what could we do? So we could do an automated MMS recharge. So, you know, using feature phones and doing it in a smart way. Uh, we can do agentless service inquiries. So, you know, allowing people to, to look at service status without even having to call a call center. Um, and then we can enable end-to-end -end digital upsell or right sell. So even if I open my app, um, I can proactively tell the customer, look, you're, home, uh, you are on a, you're on a package that you keep running out of data at the end of the month. So you should probably look at maybe upgrading to a better package or you end up with 10 gigs of data left at the end of each month. Are you sure that you need this? Can I not right sell you um, and, and maybe take you down a notch, which may not be the best thing for me revenue wise, but it'll make you happy and make you a loyal customer going forward. So those are the type of solutions that we'll drive out. In the end, what we will do is we will go back and review the call volume reduction. So did we actually reduce call volumes because we know that will save us cost? Um, subsequently, if we reduced the call volumes, did it actually translate to cost savings? So could we reapply or repurpose these agents um, and maybe reduce our licensing footprint or did, didn't it make an impact at all? Um, and could we look at the sales metrics? So are we actually uh, achieving those sales metrics that we wanted to achieve? And that's just the journey that, that we go through and that we always advise our customers to, 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 also, to also look at is, it's a simple approach, but it really helps us show value uh, in a continuous fashion. And it also helps bolster the case, uh, you know, for running, running long-term uh, engagements. All right, so, oh, sorry, just before I do that, so I'm just going to quickly say one thing that's also important, and I forgot that at the bottom of the slide, is please remember, go for rapid value deployment. So we believe in quick MVPs, so minimum viable products, uh, which means this is not a three-year journey. This is something that you could do on three-month intervals. Typically, we drive out a use case or two every quarter for our customers, and that gives you that constant value being shown in the business. Thank you so much, um, Johan. Uh, that was really informative, and I can see uh, some comments and questions coming through as well, so we're going to get through them a little bit later on. So right now, I'd like to welcome uh, to the stage uh, Pumi Doba, who is the Cluster Executive for Gauteng at IOCO. Pumi, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Nastasha. So, that was really good, John. Um, quite rich, uh, quite broad. I think um, what I'd like to say is that we're going to zoom into a specific case of a particular use case that we 
took forward uh, with a customer. So the, the reason being, um, if you look at how you should select, uh, as an example, specific use cases, you, you ought to look at what's going to give you value quite quickly. Um, so your hands last parting comments were, you know, you want to actually do things rapidly and, and you do, it's not a three year, we don't, we no longer have a, a luxury of three year projects anymore. We also, you know, have to start showing value. I think from the poll, um, you guys also selected, uh, I think it was at 32%, uh, cost, you need to optimize cost. But I mean, I'm sure all of you have heard this, but you need to uh, keep the same service levels. So a lot of the leaders um, on this on this table will know that uh, you expected uh, to ensure that the service levels are up. However, the cost needs to remain the same or it needs to actually decline. So it's a reality that you cannot avoid as a business owner. So we had a particular use case in this case study with a, it's, it's a case study in the telecommunications uh, industry. Um, one, the major challenges, uh, I think Stanley in the poll uh, and in the messages, you highlighted this fact that the portal doesn't talk to, um, to the backend. All these separate systems that talk to each other, this integration that, um, that seems to evade us. So you had multiple backend systems. Um, it's something that's validated by, you know, within your poll. So the, the operator had so many backend systems that when you look at how many interfaces a call center agent has to jump through, you know, it was a case of, you know, you've got uh, AHT coming up, average handling time. So your slow handling time is, you know, a symptom of something else. And, you know, you end up seeing that uh, in frustrated agents and frustrated customers. You also had, you know, a suboptimal leveraging of the data. Um, also, we didn't, uh, within the, the, the operator, have, you know, a, a very, how can I put it, integrated way of having a single pane of the customer. Like Johan was mentioning, you know, you want the customer attributes. Um, to be in front of you as a call center agent across all product sets. So it gives you some sort of omni-channel view of, of, of your customer. So as you actually service your customer, it's very easy for you to perform specific tasks, which then takes us to the relevance of bots in contact centers. So when we look at the use case that we selected, uh, I mentioned, we, we needed to look at specific reasons um, for the business. So we looked at the fact that it was contributing in terms of the volumes up to 23%. So 23% of the volumes were actually generated from this use case. Um, we, we then uh, made sure that within the use case, when you look at robotic uh, task automation, there's relevance there. So when you implement RPA for that particular use case, robotics process automation, sorry, we like our acronyms in the telco space. So I'll keep reminding myself when I go into an acronym without introducing it. So what we looked at was the fact that this was a candidate. Johan spoke about that. So you need to look at your processes and they need to be candidates for the particular uh, solution you want to, so, uh, to implement to solve the business problem. So it's no use waiting for an API to be ready. Um, APIs being the, 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 the way you can integrate various systems. So if you're gonna wait months for the API to be ready and robotics could give you that option, why not? So that was the problem. We had uh, frustrated agents because of the fact that you had too many systems there were, you know, you navigated through so many hoops before you actually get to even verify what you've done for the customer. There was also a perception that was beginning to creep in that people thought that the call center technology platform was, was not efficient, which was not necessarily the case. Um, it was just that you had these multiple uh, systems that didn't talk to each other, that didn't really integrate, and that led to high um, handling times, 
high handling times, you know, as a contact center leader leads to higher cost because, and, and higher cost leads to slow serve, uh, sorry, a higher waiting times also lead to um, uh, high uh, waiting times. In the poll, you guys identified that, that slow service is actually one of the challenges. Um, I think it was sitting at 21%. Um, and then, no, silo technology was 21% and slow service was at 32%. So it's clear, once you have handling times going up, because you've got these separate systems, you're gonna have slow service. Once you have slow service, you've got frustrated customers and the customers take it out on the very first person they talk to, which is the agents. You've got unhappy agents. So it's a cycle, it's a vicious cycle. So just moving ahead, that's just positioning the, the, the problem. I hope, I hope I'm, go I'm still with you guys. Uh, because I'm, I'm quite passionate about, about this particular topic, I can, I can go on. So what did we look to do? We looked uh, at making sure that we identified a use case that would allow an agent to see across um, various uh, systems. So if you had uh, four systems that you needed to integrate, let's say, to perform a prepaid voucher redemption, as an example, um, if we were to use that as a particular use case. So when I say use case, I'm, I'm referring to a task that needs to be performed by an agent. So an agent could need to redeem your, 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 your bundles. Um, an agent could, could need to, to do a recharge voucher. In this case, we selected one particular use case where you know, the candidacy of the use case meant that robotics process automation was, um, was a quick, um, deployment option for us because the customer said, you know, you've got three months to give us an MVP um, in production and we want it live and we need it, we need it working. MVP, minimum viable products. Just reminded myself that I did a, another, another acronym without actually minimum viable product, meaning that uh, we need to give you um, a solution that works uh, at 80% at and we can just enhance it. Um, launch and enhance it as we go and, and show value. So what were the value things that the customer need, needed to resolve? As I mentioned, you know, they needed to ensure that the multiple systems, if you've got three systems, you've got a bot that takes that task and actually executes it across multiple systems. And from an agent perspective, that was just a click. And the execution of the task is actually, you know, live and, and, and comes back within seconds with the data that the, agents need, the agent needs to be able to either answer the customer or um, provide, a, um, uh, provide that particular service. Like I said, a use case could be, um, you know, uh, redeeming a, a, a recharge voucher, it could be redeeming a, um, a, a, a bundle. It could be actually asking me to change my debit order date. But in this one, we zoomed into one. And we, we zoomed into one particular use case because we wanted to show the customer the value pretty quickly, which I'll share with you the results uh, pretty soon. So just when you look at, um, when you look at the, the points at the bottom there, you, you talk about attended automation where you still have um, you still have human interaction where I spoke to somebody clicking the button and the bots performing the tasks um, in the back end. And you also have the, the option where Johan was talking about a bot um, that can perform tasks on, on WhatsApp uh, to actually recharge the voucher for you. And um, also conversational AI, meaning um, conversational AI, artificial intelligence, which means we can have um, these bots, the system bots that allow the customer to feel that they're engaging a human, um, that takes away the human interaction. And it takes you close to your cost optimization um, um, uh, ideal that you need, to, you need to drive. Again, if you look at you know, business challenges, Johan touched on this, it's, very, it's becoming very, very difficult for businesses to acquire new customers, especially in the telecommunication space. It's highly saturated. You, you would rather retain your customer uh, because it costs you far less uh, to retain your customer. Um, and <clears throat> so it, it, it costs you far less to retain your customer than uh, acquiring the new customer. You've got a whole lot more effort to get to a new customer to change 
and you know then the inconvenience and the effort that the customer needs to put in so we need we needed to show the value in that while you de diminishing the cost or reducing the cost base um you can still maintain the high uh, service levels that you still need to to maintain so just to come to the results on that note um the benefits that were that were acquired from this uh, that particular use case that we selected where we took a bot and we said that it can perform the tasks in the back end throughout all those three systems that you saw on the right hand side we managed to reduce the average handling time for that particular use case across those agents from eight minutes to two minutes i still remember when we did the demonstration uh, one of the esco members said i blinked and i almost missed it for something that's supposed to be quick, it's, you know, that's a good thing. Uh, there was also, when you look at uh, significant uh, optimization of cost per contact, if, if your AHT is coming down by that much, uh, the, your cost per contact will, 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 will automatically uh, reduce. Also, you reduce the need for call bouncing. So if agents need to log on to various systems, it's very easy for them to be tempted to keep passing um, the call around based on the fact that ah, I don't have access to that other system. I don't have to the voucher access to the voucher redemption system. So I can just pass this call on to somebody that does, or I can just make up a story about the fact that it needs to be done in the back office. You know, when you have these things coming up to the, to the single pane of the customer, it's, it's, it's actually nicer for the agent as well. You have a happier agent that can just click through. And the agents that are coming through as well are agents that are far, you know, familiar with an interface that looks like a website rather than a bulky, uh, thick client that you got to install and that you got to train them on for three weeks versus a single interface. It's a web interface. It takes you a couple of hours to train the agent and the agent is ready to hit the ground running. So you also will start seeing, as we saw in this particular case, that uh, first call resolution starts uh, shooting up significantly. And again, FCR is one of your key uh, KPIs that you need to maintain while your cost is doing this, as expected by your, you know, by, by your excos. So you also see a significant improvement in employee experience. Like I said, uh, it's easy to onboard a new employee. It's easier to, um, to have that new employee relate because the interface is more intuitive. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 makes it, it makes them feel like they can go the extra mile. And I feel, you know, for you, for you guys, the value could also come in. Um, imagine you shave off six minutes of an, AT, an eight minute call. You have another two minutes to actually on sell and cross sell the customer. So previously, you were struggling with multiple systems to try and resolve this particular case for the customer, and you, it was taking you eight minutes. Now, suddenly, within two minutes, you can do that. And now we can talk about the packages that Johan's talking about, saying, I see that your data usage keeps climbing, um, and you keep buying data bundles um, at a cost significantly higher than if you had bought a recurring bundle, Mr. Customer, as an example. And you could find ways to start in, uh, you know, um, encouraging your agents to, to do these kinds of things. You can incentivize them however you like, but the benefit is there. We, you know, the, the approach and, and the solution, um, as much as we, uh, you know, Johan mentioned, we don't wanna be tech um, focused. We are tech agnostic. But the point is for this particular use case, the candidacy of that use case was good for robotics process automation. And then you start then automatically saying your customer effort score will start um, improving uh, because it takes far less to get resolved. It takes uh, far less time to get through to a customer because your average ending time is taking a dip. Uh, it means that you've got more agents becoming available sooner to actually take the next call. Your service level will automatically improve. You see, so it's like a it's like a, a domino effect of uh, of of the upside. Um, so, what did we do from a technology perspective? Um, just uh, I'm, I'm just looking, Stanley. <laughs> so, Stanley, your your you know, your your frustration around the fact that you've got the back end and and, and the front end not. So, you look at you know um, using uh, your 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 RPA uh, to 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 expose some of the, the legacy system 
um, attributes to the top layer. And you do that because the candidacy of the use case was good uh, for that. It was a repetitive task, it was clear, and it had those high level, levels of volumes. You could potentially also in the, in the middle use an API um, to get to your legacy, um, your legacy um, layer uh, to expose what you need to expose. Uh, so that's, that's where the, the non-tech um, uh, focus comes from. We look, what's, we look for what's gonna give us value quickly and what's appropriate for that particular technology that we need to implement. And this rip and replace concept is gone. Um, so, you know, you're not going to take existing systems and change them overnight. Nobody's going to allow you to do that because it, it, the business case is, is going to be difficult. Secondly, the time. So you need to leverage what you have. I mean, that's the reality now, guys. So you need to start making sure that, uh, you know, you move from the monolithic uh, architectures and you start decoupling and you have these, um, these modern, modernized architectures. So yeah, but but the point is, from a business, I know that you know that's a little bit more uh, technical. But from a business perspective, you need to be able to leverage integration, robotics, process automation to ensure that you expose that single pane of glass, which is what we did here, and that realized the benefits of driving HD down all the way from eight minutes to to to, to under two minutes. So those are the things that uh, that you know that we realized, and. I mentioned earlier, just on time to value, the customer said, we're giving you a, a three month use case, single MVP, three months. And they said, you know, if we've given you our volumes, you understand our, our, our call volumes, this, this accounts for 23% of, of, the, of the calls. So when you do the calculation uh, and you re reverse engineer it, if you look at the cost, um, the annual cost, and you look at the percentage uh, that these th these particular calls account for, it, it equated to about 20 million rand per year in terms of you know the the, the cost that you know the customer pays to service the, these 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 um, these calls that are coming through to the call center. So by achieving an AHT reduction from eight minutes to under two minutes, you know your agents are suddenly four times as effective as before. And, you know, also the total investment, when you look at making use of these technologies that don't look at rip and replace, that look at, you know, the appropriate um, um, license regime that exists within the customer and you leverage that, then your investment on, on this particular thing is, is actually quite low. So an investment of 7 million, and you look at the fact that your saving is, um, is, is 20 million per annum, you know, the ongoing cost that you save it is at about 80, 89% at 2.2, it's, it's ongoing cost of 2.2 million uh, per annum. And therefore the return on investment uh, will then become about five months. So in about five months, you're able to take the 20 million Rand that you reduced um, by, by, you know, uh, investing 7 million uh, within three months, and then the ongoing cost thereafter of 2.2 million is actually the savings that you realize immediately. And on the right hand side, you've got the, the various platforms, the technologies, um, the call center, ERP, uh, you've got seven um, CRM environments, which talks to the multiple systems the person, uh, the agent needs to talk to. And uh, we used integration, um, you know, API management on the, on the customer's Azure, Azure environment. So we've got ongoing enhancements on top of the reduction in the ROI that the customer was able to derive in, in five months. So we, we, we felt, you know, this, this particular use case proved not only from a, a customer experience perspective, from a single pane of glass, when we look at the return in investment, um, if we were to just go back at it again, total investment of 7 million, the initial cost was, was 20 million of the use case. So if an agent were to handle it, it, you, it would cost uh, 20 million rand uh, per annum. And you reduce that to 2.2 million per annum. So that's the reduction uh, that you see. It's a massive reduction of from 20 million and suddenly now you've got 
only an ongoing cost of, of 2.2 million. I hope that makes sense. So the difference between the 20 million and the 2.2 is the 89% um, reduction that you see. And therefore, when you work that um, uh, forwards, you then see a, an ROI within five months. Uh, we're confident in this uh, because it's something we, we got to, we, you know, we were honored to actually uh, implement and, 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 and derive value uh, from the customer. So for the customer. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's the story I wanted to share. Uh, sorry if the, if, the, if the cost reduction breakdown sounds a little bit complicated, but I mean, if you think about it, you spend um, 7 million Rand upfront and you're saving yourself a, two, uh, you know, a 20 million Rand per annum cost and you're reducing that down to 2.2 million um, going forward uh, based on your licensing regime. So yeah, those are th that's that's what uh, what we managed to 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 um, to get out of that uh, of that particular use case. All right, thank you so much, uh, Puni. Uh, if we can have Johan uh, join us, so we can get into that discussion. Um, for the benefit of time, I'm gonna you know weave some of my questions as long uh, along the side with uh, some of the questions from the attendees as well. I've seen uh, quite a few comments. I'm gonna try and get through as many of them as possible. I do see that we do have a helping hand on the back end who's also dealing with some of the technical issues. So thank you so much. Uh, for answering some of those. And those, we, uh, they write at the bottom and some of our attendees may not necessarily uh, have the inclination to scroll all the way down. I'm gonna repeat them for the benefit of those who have missed this webinar and want to um, have a look at it a little bit later on. So while we get those questions um, up and running on my screen, um, this question, I suppose both of you can, you know, probably help me tackle it. I mean. We've, if you take a brief look at the history of commercially available chatbots, I mean, some of us are, are familiar with Siri from Apple and IBM Watson and Alexa as well, who is um, helping us answer uh, questions. And I think the latest uh, player may be uh, Google Assistant. Uh, some of you can correct me if I'm wrong there. But based on your experience and some of the, um, the, the chatbots that you're seeing, are you starting to witness a new generation of chatbots and voice-based agents that are easier to build, faster to deploy, and more responsive to user inquiries? Um, I don't know who wants to take that one. Johan, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Thanks, uh, Nastasha. So, um, I would say both, both yes and and no. So there's there's been quite a lot of movement in terms of maturity and capability of um, I, I like to call them intelligent assistants. Um, you know, in in the enterprise space, um, what we haven't really seen or what I haven't really encountered is a, a practical uptake of uh, voice as a, a, a true interaction channel, um, you know, when it comes to customer service. So I think we, we people are quite tolerant of, uh, let's say, uh, a Bigsby or, an, or a Siri not really understanding you that well. Um, you know, when it comes to customer service, people want to be understood. So what we've seen is quite a, quite a big uptake of intelligent bots from a chat perspective, so a, little, a, a bit more text-based, but uh, bots that can actually identify and recognize intent, um, read sentiment, um, you know, and, and and really interact with me in an intelligent fashion, not just on a question and answer, you know, and I only have two answers, that's a type of means. So, so yes, we, we're seeing, we're seeing quite, a, quite a lot of movement in that space and, and those, seem to be the ones that actually get used, um, you know, compared to, to, to just a Q&A response that, that doesn't do anything. So, so that's my experience. All right. Uh, Pumi, your thoughts? I mean, um, is, do you find that there's a gap in terms of what customers expect and what can actually be delivered? Uh, how are you finding that relationship? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, uh, Agree with you. And customers need a connection, right? They they need to feel like this this they're having a conversation. So you know when you talk about you know it needs to be 
conversational AI rather than just a chatbot that just gives you it's a yes or no type answer. It's it you know it it's not it's not engaging, right? So you're likely not going to uh, maintain that that channel. So you want the customers to keep coming back to that particular channel. It needs to be fun. It needs to be engaging. And it needs to solve the problem, right? Um, it can't just be for the sake of um, interfacing. So that's where, you know, from a business perspective, you know, the 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 artificial intelligence that that you, you need to 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 implement and and leverage off of your data and and leverage off of your, of your your platforms is based on the fact that your 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 bot needs to engage the customer. It needs to connect with the customer. The, the output from that interaction is key, and it needs to drive uh, the the first call resolution. So you can't be chatting to this thing um, too many times for the same issue, and you're not getting successful result. So yeah. Yeah. One of the questions that's come through now says, is there conclusive evidence that customers in the South African landscape are becoming more accepting and willing to engage with chatbots? Are there any statistics to support it? Uh, who okay. yeah, so, uh, I'll, I think from my side, if, if I can venture first, uh, Pumi. So, uh, Gabriel, I think um, what we can, what we see is, is really uptake in the customer base that we deal with um, but but it does vary quite a lot across industry and a and, and across customer segment um, so no I, I wouldn't say any conclusive statistical studies that that we base this on um, we base this on uptake of of bots that that go out into market um, I think in the in the lower LSM sphere, you know, there's there, there tends to be less uptake, but purely because of device and, and, and technology limitations, um, especially looking at the uh, let's say the, the higher tech crowd, um, you know, it, it tends to be adopted quite well, uh, even in the customer, let's say the, the consumer, the consumer space. Once again, that is what we what we see as a service provider to customers. Um, but yes, it's just our our take on it. For me, yeah. So I mean, as you know, we we interface with business customers who then have to make sure that they enhance their service to the end customer. Uh, the trends that we're seeing is that customers are asking us for outcomes. They no longer saying, "I want to buy this bot. I want to buy this." I want to buy this platform. I want to buy, um, you know, these servers. They're saying to us, guys, um, we want an outcome. We want uh, first call resolution. We want call deflection. We want a happy customer. And we also seeing that the customer, customer, you know, our customers, the the, the business customers, I realize that um, the their customers are getting younger um, and they're getting more tech savvy. And they also, you know, the uptake of, of data services in the telco space means that people are becoming more um, tech savvy. Yes, uh, they, they've got access to data. They expect prompt service. They expect a digital channel that's always on. That's what they, I mean, why must I go and queue uh, at a shop um, and get something serviced? Why must I queue on a call center while I can just click a couple of times and, and, and things get actioned uh, for me? So we're seeing that it's becoming more and more inevitable. And at the time of COVID as well, you know, when, when movement becomes limited, digital adoption becomes a reality that customers have, you know, customers who were early adopters are realizing, hey, great, uh, it's, it's absolutely awesome that I find myself in this scenario, yet I'm able to service my customers and they keep coming back for more. That's for me. Those are the trends that are driving digitization in customers and digital transformation overall. All right. So there was a question that came in a little bit earlier on, and I think it tied in quite nicely with the poll that you had where we were trying to understand uh, the issues that uh, people are experiencing. But that particular statement, I'll call it the question, it basically alluded to the fact that I think one of our attendees probably works um, in the government sphere. And 
one of the challenges he encounters is that there is a bit of a lack of investment when it comes to the conversations that we're talking about. So then I suppose, Pumi, if you want to tackle this one, what messages do you then convey to businesses when you're interacting with them about the benefits of you know, investing in um, chatbots so that we're able to, you know, service our customers better, service people better who call in for various issues. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Nastasha. So, so for, for me, I think, you know, what's, 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 what's critical in this is, you know, the realization that the sooner you, you invest in your digital transformation strategy or your the digitization of of your business the better it is for you so you know if we start from government or even in the public space where, where you look at the fact that the concept should be services to the people so the batu uh, principle talks about that so you need to deliver services promptly to to people therefore you can't be having um, these separate disparate systems that are um, not talking to each other and you have these long queues coming out of uh, particular uh, institutions where people could actually be accessing these, these services more readily through digital channels. And, and there's also this perception about bots taking over jobs. Um, the thing is, it goes back to education as well. It, it goes back to the kind of youth that enters the job market that needs to be that needs to have the appropriate kind of skill. So, if for example you're getting more pressure to reduce your call center agents, so the entry level jobs in the calls, you know, being the call center, start shrinking. However, there is there is a whole new workforce that needs to develop these bots, that needs to supervise these bots, that needs to design and you know these processes around these bots. So it's not really taking away; it's taking away a certain type of, 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 of performing certain tasks and a certain mindset shift that we cannot actually avoid. It's, it's inevitable. It's going to happen anyway. So the sooner you embrace it, the better it is for you. Um, the next question that's come through says, what bot platform does your system use? So, uh, so I think as I mentioned uh, a bit earlier, so, so we take a technology agnostic approach. Um, from a tech perspective, what I can tell you, the most prominent um, and successful technologies that, that, that we've uh, encountered and worked with, um, probably most, um, most popular is the Microsoft uh, Azure, the bot platform. Um, so it tends to, well, those are the ones that our customers tend to favor. Apart from that, uh, we've done some development on Amazon Lex, IBM Watson as well, um, but Azure tends to be the preference. So what, once again, what we try and do is we help this design and define the customer journey that this bot needs to enable. And then we look at what is your preference from a technology point of view, and then we make it happen in that uh, tech landscape. So, so yes, it's not, it's not a specific tech, but rather a concept we implement on various technologies. Okay, um, I just want to confirm from both of you gentlemen, will you be able to send the user case study by email? Yes, no, maybe? Yes, yes. Yeah. okay, great. Uh, so this question says, how is, I think this is based on that user case study. Uh, the question reads, how is this applicable in an environment where you handle service requests at an incident management level for multiple service lines? And he gives examples here, tech support, professional services, et cetera. Um, I don't know who wants to tackle that one. Um, I'm happy to do that. Okay, cool. okay go for it, Jan. <laughs> I think the, uh, the simplest way to really try and explain that is if you look at the traditional IT service desk, um, because they, you typically run with tech support, you run with some form of services that may be rendered. So it might be device support, it might be an agent or a, a technician that has to go out and service someone on a laptop, et cetera. So, so what we would do is firstly, I think what's, what's quite prominent there is to build a bot intelligent enough from a chat perspective um, that can either service a customer or your, your end customer with some of the basics. So let's say I have an 
password reset issue. Um, so that chatbot would then interact with an RPA bot in the back, and that RPA bot would allow me to automatically reset my password. So nothing that we need from a user point of view. There might be a follow-up. So let's say um, I got logged into my on, onto my PC now, but there's something wrong. You know, I think that it's either software or hardware related. Um, so secondly, that could mean that the bot then says, well, I need a person to help me here because, you know, we need a, a human to look at this. It would create uh, a task or an incident for the actual agent to, to log in virtually. And if there's still something wrong, it could then go to the point where it automatically provisions at a placement device that gets shipped to me while I work from home. So, so we really look at the scenarios and then we try to fit the available technologies to the different scenarios. Um, but, but we make use of different, uh, I would say, supportive tools to do that. So your incident management um, and case management platforms, the bot technologies, either from a chat or from an executionary point of view. Um, yes, and then also having different categories of supportive staff to service the different things. Um, I, I hope that answers the question or addresses the question. Yeah, so if if you'll allow me to just maybe, as you were talking there, you were triggering certain thoughts for me. Um, yeah. Incident environment, if I can just take, I like doing examples, right? So you've got a fiber escalation support or fiber um, tech support area. You know, somebody would typically call in. Um, now you could basically have a bot uh, do a line test based on the data that it's it's been given. And if the line test fails, it can actually log into a, a CRM, log that particular case as a, as a system issue. And then after that, you know, give it a priority. And if you really want to get smart, you could look at um, an underlying incident that could then be, you know, linked to this incident as, as the mother incident. And then, you know, you've got the idle process um, almost um, sorted out in, the, in that particular uh, use case. And the other thing you can you, you can also look at is is you know the approach that one takes. Uh, to Johan's point, in an IT help desk scenario, you can look at uh, what's the best candidate. So I you know I kept saying candidacy quite a few times because I was quite deliberate about it because you know if you look at a password reset example, it's an awesome example. It's 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 pretty standard. Uh, it's usually your highest poll volume uh, driver. And you cannot, only, you cannot replace the human interaction altogether, but you want to look at those repetitive high volume things. So that's your approach. And then also you want to leverage as much as possible in terms of, you know, your, your process and, you know, compliance to a particular framework or practice like ITIL in your incident management framework, as an example. So that, that's what I wanted to add, Johan. Sorry. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, in terms of the effectiveness of, um, you know, the chatbots, is there a way to to measure that? Yes, definitely. So, so in most cases, what we would do is when we when we look at a specific case, use case, or journey, um, first what we'll do is we'll start out measuring the actual uh, agent time. That, that the agent takes. So that might, and that would be a, a, a process of measuring multiple agents handling a specific call. So we know from initiation through to closure, this is the time taken and the median time. Um, then what we do is we actually have quite a few metrics from a chat perspective that tracks how long a customer engages um, with a bot. So if it's through processing entirely digital, we can look at the difference. So it might have been two minutes uh, if an agent helped me, and it might be a case of 20 seconds when the bot helps me. Or it may be a bit of a hybrid scenario. So the bot might do a lot of the background work, but my agent still picks up the call uh, and addresses the customer and closes the call. In those cases, we would pick up which, which portions the bot goes and does, which, which portions the agent still does, and we actually uh, show those metrics compared to what our baseline process was. So yes, uh, definitely possible. And I think it's actually very important because that informs 
the success of automating that process. Um, you know, if you're able to track that. Okay, so this one is, um, I think, uh, Debbie sharing her, and uh, you know, her frustration with dealing with, um, you know, um, call center issues and that friction that can exist there sometimes. Johan, you were talking about this, um, you know, amount of data that is constantly at call centers. Do we eventually get to a point where we having um, as as many queries as, pos uh, as possible being answered by the virtual agents before any calls are handed over to humans? Or is it a case where you need that seamless interaction, whereas, I don't know, the chatbot is listening to various nuances uh, in that conversation so that you're not constantly repeating yourself every time you're trying to deal with a different, with the same query that is? Like, do we eventually get to that point or are we almost there? So it's a it's a complex it's a complex answer. <laughs> so I think that there's really two trains of thought. So 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 the one is um, you know if you if you train a chatbot right or the right way if you approach it the right way you will constantly educate your bot. So if you think about a bot, it's almost like a kid. You know, so, you know, when, when a child is born, they don't automatically know everything you know when you graduate at matric. They need to be taken through school. They need to be educated. And the more that the, the more customers interact with this bot, the more opportunity we have to educate and train this bot. So it becomes smarter and smarter and smarter. So I think that's the first thing. So taking that approach is very important. So then it, it learns based on experience because I might think theoretically I can teach this bot these 10 sentences and people will use these 10 sentences to, to speak to it. But you put that thing out in the market and people start asking it questions in different languages and it asks, and they use different abbreviations and all of a sudden we need to cater for these things. So, so constantly training and educating your bot is, is quite important. Um, I think secondly, we also need to be smart about um, you know, what are the things that we want the bot to handle and when should we know that it's now time for an agent to become part of the conversation? Because failing to do so, we're going to get into a situation where, um, you know, the bot may not know it's time to hand over and it will frustrate customers because they're not getting solved. So I think balancing those two, um, you know, are, are actually quite important and that's part of that customer journey design um, phase that I think is very experienced. So customer journey design, customer experience expectations, those will inform you know these journeys and, and, and conversational loops that we need to build. Right, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, one of our attendees wants to know, is there a key difference between call center agents and service desk agents? In my mind, and in my opinion, no. I think that, uh, you know, whether you call the call center agent or call the service desk agent, you're still an agent servicing customers. Customer um, experience. 100%. We, we treat them one and the same, whether you're inbound, outbound, internal facing, you know, we, we see that as the same processes and the same the roles. Okay. It's the outcome that matters. Yes. Customer experience. So if a company was now looking to take this conversation further and want to start, uh, you know, deploying some of the, you know, um, suggestions you put forward when it comes to chatbots, where do you start, especially if you're now probably serious about getting that digital transformation rolling? So, uh, Bumi, I don't know if you want to weigh in. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah. so for me, so for me, I think it's simple. Let's, uh, I always say, let's look at what are those key drivers. So yes, it's a great thing that we want to transform, but why? You know, yeah. are we doing this for customer experience, or are we doing this for cost? Are we doing this to grow our customer base? So first, understand that, and then we look at how. I think that's the that's very important. We understand the why, then we look at the how, and be realistic. 
you're not going to boil the ocean. Um, eat the elephant a bite at a time, um, but do it fast so that we can so that we can show value and we can change those outcomes. Because a lot of the time, the money that you need to spend to digitize and transform uh, could actually be pulled from savings that you realize by transforming. And, and these are important things to consider. So that's how I would suggest you think about it. And, you know, obviously we, we would love it if you call us to help you, but uh, <laughs> I think- Will you share contact details? Because one of the attendees wanted to know just before we wrap up, will you, are you willing to share? Okay, great. Yes. So um, we will be sharing contact details and we'll also have uh, this webinar available for anyone who couldn't make it or who had to drop off for work-related reasons. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining me in this conversation. Johan Dupria and Pumi Ndoba, we've uh, touched on numerous things, how to increase the drive towards you know, digital first call resolution. We looked at how to enhance customer and employee experience with also reducing um, costs per contact. And um, Pumi's favorite discussion, decreasing the call average handling time and better helping to predict uh, customer behavior. So thank you so much um, for participating. That is it from me until next time. Uh, goodbye and thank you so much for joining us. Cheers everybody. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.